Picture the scene. It's early afternoon on the 5th of March, 1936. Overhead, a sound that would later become iconic. The Supermarine Type 300 had just taken off on its maiden flight. The particular aircraft, K5054, was the prototype of what would become the iconic and much-loved Spitfire. By the time production ceased, a decade later, in March 1948, over 20,000 had been produced in 24 different variants. In this film, I'm following the development of the Spitfire. From its origins in R.J. Mitchell to its crucial role in the Battle of Britain. By speaking to a current Royal Air Force reservist about its military importance. Visiting the Solent Sky Museum to find out about its design and speaking to a current pilot to find out what it's like to fly. This is the Spitfire story. As an aerospace engineering student and former air cadet, I'm interested in the Spitfire because of its design and its significance in history. The Spitfire is particularly interesting to me because I went to school less than five miles from where RJ Mitchell, its designer, did. I'm on my way to meet Sam, a current RAF reservist to find out about the importance of the Spitfire in military history, particularly in the Battle of Britain of 1940. Lovely to meet you, Will. Great to meet you too, Sam. So, how important was the Battle of Britain in the outcome of World War II? The Battle of Britain marked the Allies' last stand against Hitler's planned domination of Europe. It was Hitler's plan to achieve aerial supremacy over the British Isles, before launching a large amphibious assault on the islands. The RAF thwarted his plans and therefore making his, his ideas of invasion impossible. What role did the Spitfire play in the Battle of Britain? The Spitfire filled a huge operational gulf in the Royal Air Force's air strategy. It excelled at high level altitude, meaning that it could compete directly with the Focke-Wulf 190 and that streamlined the RAF's aerial strategy, meaning that the Hurricane could attack the slower targets whereas the Spitfire could attack those higher, faster targets. Well, thanks for your time, Sam. It's been great to speak to you. No problem. RJ Mitchell was born in Kidsgrove, Stoke-on-Trent, in Staffordshire, in 1895. At the age of 16, he was apprenticed to a local railway engine manufacturer, where he eventually worked in their drawing office. At the end of his apprenticeship, he moved to Supermarine in Southampton, and in 1920, at the age of just 25, was made chief engineer. He became so well respected within the company that when Vickers took it over in 1928, one of the conditions was that he remained a designer there for at least five years. The path towards the Spitfire truly began in 1927 with the S5. It won the Schneider Trophy competition that year, the challenge being to fly around a pylon marked course as quickly as possible. The competition had been held since 1913 and the rule stated that any country to win three times in a row would win the trophy outright. Here at the Solent Sky Museum is this aircraft, an S6A. Built as an S6 for the 1929 competition, it was developed from the S5, the main difference being that the 875 horsepower Napier Lion engine was replaced with the 1900 horsepower Rolls-Royce R. The sister aircraft of this, N247, won the competition, while this one was disqualified because of flying inside the pylons. You can hardly blame the pilot though, look at the cockpit behind me, there's absolutely no forward visibility whatsoever. Funding was given for the 1931 entry to the competition only nine months before the event. As such, the time was extremely limited, so instead of building a new aircraft, all that Supermarine could do was modify the S6. The result was the S6B, with the new version of the Rolls-Royce R, rated at 2,150 horsepower, and also longer floats. This aircraft behind me was modified into an S6A, which meant that the engine was replaced, but the floats were kept at the original length. In the event, the S6B N1596 won the competition and therefore the trophy outright. To look at how the Schneider Trophy racing aircraft led to the Spitfire, I've come into the museum's archives to look at this impressive collection of models and also this drawing. This model is of the Type 224, a prototype fighter designed by Mitchell However, it had problems with the engine's cooling system, and so it was rejected by the Air Ministry in favour of this, the Gloucester Gladiator. By the time of its rejection, though, Mitchell was already working on a much more advanced design. Here is an early design drawing of this aircraft, and you can see from the line behind the cockpit that it looks like a Hawker Hurricane. 
it was further refined into the Spitfire, which is represented by this model, and you can see that it is a much sleeker design than the Type 224. Even on this early drawing, you can see the key feature of the Spitfire, the elliptical wing. This was partly chosen because it was the most efficient configuration aerodynamically, but it was chosen not just because of this, because it was difficult to construct. The other reasons that it was chosen were because it gave the largest internal volume for the four machine guns and landing gear. I'm here with Matt in the Bultley Flight Academy's hangar in front of a chipmunk which they use for basic training before converting into the Spitfire. So I'm interested to know how the Spitfire's flying characteristics compare to other similar aircraft such as the Hurricane. The uh, Spitfire's characteristics are predicated on two things really, the, the engine of course and the wing design. But for the purpose of uh, manoeuvrability and flying characteristics, it's really more about the wing. The Hurricane, for example, had a much fatter wing route which creates drag and therefore means the aircraft is a lot slower. It means also therefore a slower roll rate. What RJ Mitchell designed was a much fabled elliptical wing which was able to fly at very, very slow speeds and very high speeds without any real physical changes to the wing like you might with the modern airliner which needs flaps, for example. So from a pilot's point of view, being able to fly the same wing at 60 miles an hour and at 400 miles an hour, it gave you every hope and every chance against whatever your enemy could throw against you. So really, phenomenal uh, handling aircraft, even these days compared to lots of modern aeroplanes. But at the time, you know, we can only put ourselves back 80 years and, and what it, imagine what it must have been like to be a pilot going from a Tiger Moth, which is a huge drag biplane, to a Harvard, which is like a flying brick with not much power, straight into the front of a Spitfire, which was just the height of technology at the time. How do you use the Spitfires here at the Boltby Flight Academy? We set up to train Spitfire pilots uh, five years ago now, and during that time we have flown people who'd, who'd never flown a, anything similar before, just on a, on a taster introduction flight and then each year we convert about between five and eight people to the type always fairly experienced guys subsequent to that we've just been approved to fly non-pilots in the airplanes as well so going forward uh, we'll be taking members of the public up and our, our reason for doing it firstly we love flying them we think it's really important that they continue to fly because they play such an important part in our heritage and thirdly we think it's only fair that having affected so many people, that those people have a, an opportunity to, to get inside and, and feel and, and know what it's about. Well, it's, it's been great to speak to you, thank you very much. It's a pleasure, <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> Over the course of making this film, I've worked with people and materials that I would not normally have an opportunity to do so, giving me a deep insight into what makes the Spitfire special. To me, the most remarkable part of the story is that of R.J. Mitchell, who died in 1937 at the age of just 42. Today, his name is well known, as you can see on the wind tunnel behind me here at the university, but he never saw this recognition. He leaves behind him a legacy of an aircraft that remained in production until three years after the end of World War II and continues flying to this day. The Bultley Flight Academy shows that the Spitfire story still is continuing and long may it do so.